Take your Bibles and go to the first chapter of the first epistle to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we will read the last three verses of 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is number 4 uh, in our series on Wednesday nights of 1 and 2 Timothy. We're preaching through the books of 1 and 2 Timothy on Wednesday nights. And we started uh, four weeks ago tonight. So this is the number fourth message in, uh, the, in preaching through the books of 1 and 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And if you join me in honor of the reading of God's word, we'll read verses 18, 19, and 20. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let me read this verse 20 once again. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. Our passage this evening culminates with Paul delivering unto Satan Hymenaeus and Alexander. Tonight's message is entitled Hymenaeus and Alexander, the evil navigators. Hymenaeus and Alexander, the evil navigators. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, tonight we're going to preach on two men who, uh, what a, a strange, it seems to us, thing to just be given over or delivered unto Satan. There's two men that had turned many away that caused many to... to uh, be shipwrecked. Lord, I pray you'd help me preach the Word of God uh, purely. Lord, I, I pray that in the Spirit, uh, the, the same Holy Spirit that was on Paul uh, to write uh, the book of Timothy, the same uh, Holy Spirit that, that caused Paul to stand and preach the Word of God. Lord, I pray you give me that the power of, of uh, your Holy Spirit, your Holy Ghost. Lord, you'd fill me with your Spirit. Fill each uh, listener, each hearer, those with us here tonight with uh, the Holy Spirit. I just pray you'd be a, uh, this message would be a help and a blessing to all that hear. Help me preach, rightly divide the word of truth. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. The phrase delivered up means to literally give over, surrender, or give to. And so here in our, our passage, it says, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. This is the same phrase in Matthew 26, Mark 10, and Luke 20 in regard to Judas Iscariot betraying Jesus to the chief priests and the scribes. Uh, he, Jesus was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, delivered unto the chief priests and the scribes. This, and so uh, 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 Paul is saying, I'm delivering up Hymenaeus and Alexander, not to the chief priests, not to the scribes, not to any other people, but unto Satan. Think about that. What a powerful statement that is. What a strong statement this, that it is. This is such a strong act, action, and it shouldn't be taken lightly or thought that it was just used uh, or used for just anyone that the Apostle Paul didn't like or didn't get along with. It's not that Paul just said, hey, th th these are guys that I don't like or uh, I don't, I'm not in lockstep with and I don't like them and, and uh, uh, I, th I don't like their personalities or there's just, we don't get along and so I'm delivering them over to Satan. No, there is something greater at play here. There's something greater here than just them not getting along or him not liking Hymenaeus and Alexander. In fact, this action is only used twice in Scripture, according to my study. And we won't get to the other place, but it's a similar situation in Second, uh, uh, First Corinthians, I believe, where uh, there's some that were, that would, were uh, uh, committing uh, adultery in, in, in such a way that even the, the unbelievers wouldn't do. And I think it's Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians uh, chapter 5, I believe. And it, what it says about them is they were given up to the devil. Give them up to the devil, or deliver them up to the devil, and so or up to Satan. Same uh, uh, verbiage, same wording, and so it's and from my story, according to my study, the only two times in all of Scripture that this is done, uh, delivered unto Satan, given up. Uh, uh, it's as if Paul said, "Hey, uh, I'm, I'm I'm giving up on these guys. I'm not going to try to talk to them. I'm not going to try to help them. I, I'm I'm done with them." 
I, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything with Hymenaeus and, and Alexander. I'm giving them up. I'm delivering them up to Satan. I mean, literally, like, he's, he's trading them in. Or just, just Satan, have them. Take them. Such strong action. In fact, this action, as I mentioned, is only mentioned twice in Scripture. If this is such an extreme action, I think it is important that we answer some questions about these men. At least I have questions about these men. <laughs> if, if Timothy, if the Holy Spirit uh, 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 prods and, and inspires Timothy to serve, uh, Paul to tell Timothy, I'm giving Hymenaeus and Alexander up to Satan, I'm delivering them up to Satan, there's some questions at least that I have, and hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions tonight. I have four questions in reference to Hymenaeus and Alexander that we'll attempt to, that we will attempt to answer tonight. The four questions are, who are they or who were they? What did they do? What, why was what they did so bad or why were they so bad? And then what was Timothy to do? So hopefully during the, the message tonight, we'll answer all four of those questions. First of all, who were they? I don't know that I've, I've heard Hymenaeus and Alexander mentioned in messages. I don't know that I've ever heard an me, uh, entire message on Hymenaeus and Alexander. And so uh, it, it, when we see those names, we'll see them in other places in Scripture, but sometimes it's hard to connect the dots. And so we say, who are these guys? Who, who are Hymenaeus and Alexander? It is interesting to note that they are both mentioned in First and Second Timothy. Remember what we said about 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, a very similar theme throughout these two books. The idea is that, uh, Timothy, hey, you have, to pre you have to teach to pass on uh, uh, a sound doctrine. You have to pass on uh, the teaching of God's word. You have to, to pass on because uh, uh, you have to warn those that are not teaching right or teaching other doctrines other doctrine, I think it mentions in verse 3 of chapter 1 here, and so you have to charge, you have to warn those, and the emphasis is to pass on sound doctrine to the next generation, to the next group of people, because there are some that are trying to subvert the doctrine, they're trying to teach false doctrine, and so they, you got to make sure that, that they get it. Well, that, that same theme in First and Second Timothy is, is mentioned, and both Hymenaeus and Alexander are mentioned in both books, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Look at, uh, well, we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. They're both mentioned there. Then take your Bibles and go back to, and we're going to turn uh, a little bit tonight, and so make no apologies, but just be ready. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 says, um, and I'm just going to read the one verse, and we'll come back to it. And their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus. There's Hymenaeus. He said, hey, their word eats like a canker. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment. But Hymenaeus is mentioned there in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 17. And then uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 14. Turn there, if you would. A couple pages back. Alexander, uh, Alexander the coppersmith. This is uh, near the end of Paul's life, and this is near the end of se the second uh, epistle to Timothy, and he's wrapping it up, and he says, and he's, he's commending some. Well, this was no commendation at all. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So, both in First Timothy and in Second Timothy, Hymenaeus and Alexander have been named. So uh, remember, uh, uh, and I, I'm going back a little bit because not everybody was here at the beginning of First Timothy. Uh, 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 Paul was in uh, Ephesus. He, he, he began to preach and people got saved and a church began and he left Timothy as the pastor there and he went on and now the books of First and Second Timothy are both to, to remind Timothy of the things that Paul has already told him. In fact, it says, hey, teach sound doctrine, teach what is right. And, and, and in this first chapter, we're still laying some groundwork for the importance of Timothy preaching and, I'm sorry, teaching the, the truth and teaching and passing on the, the sound doctrine. Uh, now we're going to get into some of the things that are important to teach. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about women. Why would you say pastor doesn't want me to talk? Uh, pastor doesn't want women talking in church. As you're talking. All right. Uh, uh, uh. 
in, in, in chapter two, it will talk about women talking in church. In chapter three, in chapter three, we'll talk about, uh, in chapter three, uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the, the qualifications, requirements for a pastor and then a deacon and so forth and so on. There, there are some things that, Tim, that, that Paul is teaching Timothy, hey, make sure you preach it straight because there's some that are perverting it. There's some that are, are changing the truth. And so we see uh, 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 Timothy being warned in both epistles, first and second Timothy. Hymenaeus, you say, who were Hymenaeus and Alexander? Hymenaeus was almost assuredly a Greek. His name is the same as a mythological Greek god of marriage who is kin to Cupid. So he was a Greek that worshiped false gods. Uh, Alexander, however, was a Jew. We find out about Alexander in Acts chapter 19. Take your Bibles and go back to Acts chapter 19. It is important that we rightly divide the word of truth. It's important that we study to show ourselves approved of God, both in, 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 in uh, First and Second Timothy. Uh, Timothy was uh, uh, encouraged often, hey, make sure you study the word of God, make sure you know it's, what's right before you preach it. Make sure that, 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 you have, that you have it down before you begin to preach it. And, and uh, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander are two of the reasons why it's so important for, for uh, Timothy to do that. And so uh, here in Acts chapter 19, Paul comes to Ephesus. Uh, and when he gets to Ephesus, he finds some disciples there, some folks that were already uh, believers, if you will. They were already disciples. And so he sets them straight and he asked them, he said, hey, it's interesting. He said, uh, do, do, do you, uh, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? They said, well, we don't know if there is a Holy Ghost. <laughs> we never even heard of the Holy Ghost. He said, well, what were you baptized into? They said, well, we were baptized into John's baptism. And John's baptism was baptism of repentance. He said, well, uh, yes, it was baptism of repentance, done to believing in Jesus Christ. And so they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and so he begins to teach some of those that already believed, he begins to teach them there in Ephesus. And things really begin to go well. And uh, he runs into some uh, vagabond Jews that are exorcists. But if it weren't right there in scripture, it'd be hard to even believe. Vagabond exorcist Jews. Right there in uh, Exodus 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, uh, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus. And so he, here comes these, uh, these he, he runs into some trouble with some vagabond exorcist Jews. And, uh, 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 and um, he sets them straight. Uh, uh, and then, um, in fact, if we look at this, I, I love verse 15. This has nothing to do with the message. But one of these, uh, one of these exorcists come to speak to an evil spirit, and I say, I, 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 I tell thee, or I adjure thee, what do you say? Uh, um, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. <laughs> he says, hey, I command you in the name of the, the, the guy that Paul preaches, Jesus, I command, you in, I command you in his name. And the evil spirit says, uh, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but I don't know who you are. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. Not, I mean, uh, humorous, not hilarious, humorous that, that who, who are you anyway? I know who Jesus is and I know who Paul is, but I don't know who you are. And then things, uh, miraculous things begin to happen in Ephesus. He casts out devils, he heals diseases. In fact, you look at verse number 12, uh, uh, you ever wonder where these guys, these faith healers on TV get the, the practice of selling a handkerchief? Uh, uh, they don't have the, the gift of healing, but this is where it's, it's a, a twist uh, of scripture that they're getting it from this, uh, from Paul right here in Ephesus. And some miraculous things are happening in Ephesus. Uh, interesting uh, uh, conversation between uh, um, Sceva, Sceva and the, the evil spirits. And then we look at verses 17 and 18, and many believed. And verses, in verse 19, many were changed changed in an unbelievably miraculous way. Look at verse number 19. Many of them also which used, so in verses 17 and 18, you see that they were believed, they believed, and Jesus was magnified, and they, they believed and came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse 19, many of them also which used curious arts or witchcraft uh, brought their books together. They burned their Harry Potter books. 
and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So they, they, they brought all their witchcraft books and their, all, their, all the, their, their garbage, they brought it together and they burned it. And we're, we're talking about miraculous conversion here in Ephesus. And Paul is, stays here about two years preaching. And after this, this great... Uh, uh, um, change where people are, are starting to, to get rid of their witchcraft and, and get rid of their idolatry it causes a stir look at verse 21 after these things were ended Paul purposed in the spirit that he would he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying after I have been there I must also see Rome uh, um, so then uh, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him Tim Timotheus and Erastus but he himself stayed in Asia for a season so he sent uh, 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 Timothy away. At some point, Timothy comes back and, and is pastoring the church in Ephesus. We know that from the beginning of 1 Timothy. And at the same time, excuse me, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith. Now, what did we say that Alexander was from 2 Timothy 4, 14? What was Alexander? Coppersmith, okay? So here is Demetrius, a silversmith. Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. He was wealthy. He was a wealthy man, made a lot of money off of idolatry, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. You think a coppersmith might be of like occupation with a silversmith? I can't guarantee it, but I would say it's probably likely. Uh, uh, so he called together the workmen of like occupations, the first union, the idol-making union, the local 666. You know it's a union because they're idol workers. Brother, brother, uh, brother Alex is going to write me, he's a shop steward, he's going to write me up here if I don't uh, keep moving. Anyway, all right, it's a... Verse 25, whom we called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Hey, this is how we make our money. This is how we've gotten wealthy. Moreover, ye see and hear that none alone at Ephesus, but almost, all through, uh, almost uh, throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. What an amazing argument to me. It's unbelievable that here's this guy, Demetrius, and said, hey guys, we make our money on convincing people that the things we make with our hands are God's. And we can't have that. <laughs> that philosophy is, uh, I'm telling you, what, what he's, what he's it's no, listen, it's no different than what we do today. No different at all. We want to say, hey, uh, we, we say, well, there's no really idolatry much in America. N not true. These men were, cr were working with their hands, making something that other people worshipped, and that was their idol, their wealth. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, the, uh, 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 back in Timothy again, it says, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. What we make with our hands is what we worship. That's what he's saying right here. What we make with our hands. Uh, I, I worship my education, and I worship my degree, and I worship my job, and I worship my, my paycheck, and my, and my car, and my house. That's what America worships. Right. How dare them preach against that? Preaching against the way we have wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear, I'm sorry, and he says it's not just in Ephesus, it's all throughout Asia, through what we would call Turkey now. So that not only this, our craft is in danger, verse 27, to be set at naught, but also, listen, that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, listen, and her magnificence should be destroyed. Whose magnificence was it? Was it Diana's or theirs? They were the ones that were making it with their hands. Hey, they're going, they're, they're despising our handiwork. They're despising what we've done with our hands, what we've made with our hands, and, and the magnificence of Diana. Diana had nothing to do with that. They were doing that with their hands. And yet they were saying, hey, if, if Paul has his way, oh, they're going to despise. Yes, it was Diana. He's saying Diana, but our own magnificence, our, our own importance, we're not going to be important. We're not going to have any wealth. 
that, that her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Verse 28, and when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana out of the, uh, of the Ephesians. Another, another thing there is pride. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They wanted all of Asia, all of Turkey, to worship Diana of Ephesus. And we'll find out later that they believed that uh, Diana came down, <coughs> excuse me, Diana came down and landed in Ephesus off of Saturn or something. Let's, we'll get to it. <clears throat> Verse 29, the whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So they come into this, what I believe is like an open air um, stadium type thing. And when Paul uh, would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. I can see Paul going, come on, guys. And they said, no, Paul, you're not. And Paul <laughs> grabbed him by the arms and, and said, no, Paul, you're, it's too dangerous for you to go in there. And so <laughs> and when Paul, verse 30, uh, would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were, were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself. And please, please don't go into the theater. You're going to get killed. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. There was craziness going on in the theater. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Why are we even here? There's just people yelling this and that big argument, a, a mob, a, a riot. Nobody knows what they really are thinking, they believe. And so we see Alexander, verse 33, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude. You say, are you sure this is the same Alexander? There are other Alexanders mentioned in Scripture. Well, I, I believe this is the same Alexander for several reasons. Uh, the silversmith is there. Uh, the coppersmith, uh, he's a coppersmith. Uh, them of the same or similar uh, 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 work were, were all together. And then uh, um, Timothy was in Ephesus. We know that from 1 Timothy chapter 1. And this is happening in Ephesus. And we know that, that uh, he withstood him to his face. And so I think this is the same Alexander. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with his hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And then a politician gets in and settles things down to some degree, and we won't read the rest of the chapter. But basically he says, listen guys, they didn't mean what they said. <laughs> Go back and look at it. They, they didn't mean that Diana's not a god. They didn't hurt you, and they haven't done anything illegal. Let's just all, just trying to, a real po politician. Look at it, what he said. We don't have time, but the town clerk comes in and says, uh, basically just smooths things over. They didn't mean it. They didn't really mean what they said, and they haven't done anything illegal. Just, just calm down, and so then people leave. So Alexander is in Ephesus. Now, get back to my notes, and I'm only on page two. Was Alexander a believer speaking in defense of Gaius and Aristarchus? You say, well, it doesn't really say what Alexander said. He stood and held his hand up and, and, and he was going to be in defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, they wouldn't let him talk. So, Pastor, how do you know that he was even going, he was going to withstand Paul? How do you know? Well, the scripture doesn't say clearly, but he was either one of three groups, a believer speaking in defense of Gaius and Aristarchus, one of these vagabond exorcist Jews, or part of Demetrius's crowd that were speaking out against Paul. I believe he was in the third group. Oh, well, Scripture doesn't clearly say what he was about to defend, but I believe that he was in the third group for three reasons. He was a coppersmith. Paul said that he did much evil to him, and he stood him to his face, and then he turned him over to Satan, and then he was turning people away from faith in God and causing others to be shipwrecked. So I believe Alexander here is, is standing and speaking out against the Word of God, speaking out against Paul, which leads us, you say, the first question was, who, are, who were these men? This leads us to our second question, what did they do? Well, both Hymenaeus and Alexander were separating others from faith in God. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is really the crux of the message, this and the second question. What was 
what were they doing? What, okay, so we know Hymenaeus and Alexander, one's a Greek, one's a Jew. Uh, they both withstood, they both spoke out against Paul, they both preached, uh, uh, were turned over to, to the devil or, or, or delivered unto Satan. Um, what, uh, what did they do? What was the big deal? Why? Look, look what it says. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about the first uh, few phrases of verse 19 in First Timothy chapter one, uh, holding faith and a good conscience. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're kind of going backwards these verses, but but let me look at these phrases, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So which some, and then we find out that those some are of whom uh, Hymenaeus and. Uh, uh, Alexander uh, uh, is, or of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, they're the sum, having put away. They have separated something from something else, or someone from something else. The phrase put away in, uh, is not something we use that often unless we're putting something in a cupboard, but the idea of putting away is getting rid of it, separating it from us. You see, the first time you see this phrase is in the book of Genesis, I think it's chapter 35, and, and uh, 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 Jacob is going to Bethel, the house of God, and, and he's already met with uh, Esau, and God's going to change his name, it's, uh, uh, he's, gonna, uh, uh, he's about ready to see his father, uh, um, uh, well, his, his dad had already died, but where he's about uh, uh, to, to uh, his wife's about to die, it's near the end of his life, and his name's changing, he goes to Bethel, and he goes to his wife, and he says, put away... This is interesting, the idols. Put away the false gods. Put them away. Take them and it's not just put them in a cabinet for, say, for you know, when it's time to eat. Get rid of them. Separate them all together. Drop kick them out of here. Put them away. This, the second thing time you see, the, the second time you see the word put away is in Exodus chapter 12. It's during the, the Passover, and Moses is telling uh, uh, the Jews, the Hebrew children, what to do during the Passover, and he says that they are to put away leaven out of your houses. And that doesn't mean that you put it in the cupboard outside your house. It says you get rid of it. We don't want any, any so it's so, uh, and then the third time it's used, it's in Leviticus 21, Levitical uh, um, law, and it's saying, neither uh, shall any, uh, they take a woman put away from her husband. Basically divorced, separated, uh, out of relationship. And so I, I'm, I'm emphasizing that because it's important that that word put away is what Hymenaeus and Alexander are doing with the people that are in Ephesus. So what's happening is, and I haven't done off the platform since we've started. But what's happening is, and I won't use, I was gonna use Brother Abraham, we won't. What's happening is, this is the faith over here. This is uh, uh, people believing. What's happening is, Hymenaeus and Alexander are taking them and they're putting them away from the faith. This says concerning the faith. They're moving them, they're taking them away from the word of God. Let's look at it again which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Which some, that's Hymenaeus and Alexander, having put away, they are the ones that are separating them. What are they putting away? They are, uh, what are they moving people away from? What are they separating away from? Concerning the faith, faith in, in God and, the, and His Word. What are they doing? Listen, they are teaching people other doctrine. That's what they're doing. They're teaching people something other than the faith. And it's important, there's, we have some visitors here tonight to, uh, to reemphasize the idea, the difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is when you proclaim something, teach is when you pass something down or you pass it on. The emphasis on preaching is the topic. The emphasis on teaching is uh, the transfer. If I uh, desire to preach and I come up here and preach and nobody gets it, you hear, but you don't walk away believing, then I can still say that I preached. But if I come up here to teach, and, and uh, I, I try to teach, and everyone walks away, no one walks away having learned something, having gained something, having gotten something from it, then I failed at teaching. Teaching is literally passing information from one to the next. My, my, uh, my brother's here, he's a principal, he's got his juniors and seniors from his Christian school, and, and uh, a teacher's job is to take the information and pass it down to the student. And we find out at test time whether or not the student got it or not. 
And if the student didn't get it, one of two things happened. The teacher didn't teach or the student didn't learn, but there was not any teaching done. Yeah, we, we say teaching like in a classroom, but I mean actually teaching. That's what the word means. And so what's happening is Hymenaeus and Alexander are teaching. They're passing on false doctrine. They're taking disciples and they're preaching false doctrine to them. They're taking and separating them from the faith. That's exactly what's happening here. What are they doing? They're teaching people other doctrine, not sound doctrine. We don't have to go back. We don't have time to go back and re-preach the rest of uh, First Timothy chapter 1. They were passing on to others false doctrine, which leads us to our third question. Who were they? What did they do? Why was what they did so bad? What's the big deal about this? Teaching false doctrine, putting away some concerning the faith, was causing others to be shipwrecked. When men teach something other than the Word of God, it wreaks havoc in the lives of men and women. A teacher is like a lighthouse that shows the ships, the rocks that peril their lives, but a false teacher is an evil navigator that turns ship away from the lighthouse so that their ships end up wrecked and broken on the rocks. And what was happening with Hymen and people. They were taking them away from false, uh, 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 sound doctrine. They were teaching, taking people away from the faith. They were taking people away from doctrine and preaching false doctrine. And they're being broken on the rocks, shipwrecked. Their lives were a wreck. And this was not just, uh, Paul wasn't just turning them or delivering them unto Satan because there's just some guys that didn't believe them. No, they were speaking out and convincing others to, to turn away from the faith. You have these guys that are not just, if I, there's plenty of people that didn't listen to Paul and Paul would have just left them alone, but Paul turns these guys over to, or delivers them unto Satan. Why? Because he's taking disciples. He's taking believers and he's literally turning them away, causing them to put their faith away, causing shipwreck in their lives. He's causing harm and, 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 and problems in their life. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 10. Well, we could read the entire chapter, but we won't. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He says, hey, listen, I'll put up with anything. Listen, this is the heart of Timothy. I know it's the Holy Spirit working through Timothy, but you see the heart of, sorry, the heart of Paul. I'll put up with anything so that people can come to the knowledge and save the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I, I'll endure whatever it takes. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. He said, I don't care if I die in this, I'll live with him one day. It is a faith, uh, uh, verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we also will de uh, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. He said, Timothy, there are some that are teaching words that are not beneficial, that are not helpful. They're subverting them. Who are these guys? Then he says this, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, parsing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, listen, and their word will eat as doth a canker, a cancer. That's the same word that we have. A, a, a cancer of whom is, who is this guy? Hymenaeus. He said, hey, Hymenaeus and then uh, uh, Philetus. Hymenaeus, they're, they're preaching false doctrine that's cancerous. It's destroying lives. 
the word of God edifies, then the false doctrine eradicates. If the word of God is pure, then false doctrine is polluted. If the word of God nourishes, then false doctrine nauseates. If the word of God grows and prevails, then false doctrine grieves and punishes. If the word of God sanctifies, then false doctrine soils. The word of God gives life and peace, and false doctrine gives lies and problems. What I am saying is that they were causing shipwreck by teaching false doctrine, by teaching some other doctrine than the Word of God. So what was Timothy to do? Our last question. Timothy was charged, commanded, to war a good warfare according to and by the prophecies prophecies that went uh, before on him. Look at verse 24. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 18 back in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. This charge command I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them, by these prophecies, mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good uh, conscience. In other words, he was to arm himself with the sword of the Spirit. You say, where was that found? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians, back to the uh, Ephesians again. He was to study to show himself approved, 2 Timothy 2.15. He was to be apt to teach, 1 Timothy 2.24. He was to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.1. He was to endure hardships as a good soldier, 2 Timothy 2.3. And charge some that they teach no other doctrine. We see that in verse number 3 of 1 Timothy 1. Do you see why the books of Timothy are all about teaching truths? and warning others about false doctrines and challenging the false teachers? Pastor, why is that so important? Why are the books of, and we're going to get to other things of what it's talking about as we continue in this series, but I want to try to encourage you uh, in tonight's message. Hey, if you're a parent, if you're a Sunday school teacher, get in God's Word. Make sure you got it right before you begin to teach it. It's so important that you pass down the Word of God. I was talking to somebody the other day. I won't mention who it was, but his his brother is a a retired police officer, and his niece, nephew, are in the the riots, anti-police. You say, how is that? How is that possible? They have a police officer. Well, and I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just saying that what will happen is we have got to teach. We have a, a passive. Uh, we have a, a, and I don't know this person, and so I, I don't know that that's what they did, but I, as I thought about that, I was, how is that possible? What happens is we, we, we begin a very passive teaching or parenting. What we do is we just say, all right, I, I believe this, but it doesn't matter. Or we'll let my children come to whatever belief they come to. It happens all the time. And they're running the streets right now. We need parents, we need teachers to pass on sound doctrine. If if my children don't serve God, if my children don't have the Word of God as a foundation, as the the most important book in their lives, I'm not saying that they go to the, if they go into the ministry or they a pastor or a pastor's wife or on a mission field. I'm just saying I, that, that does, if, if, they're, if they make the word of God the most important book in their lives, the most important uh, 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 principle in their lives, then whether they go into the ministry is neither here nor there. I mean, they'll, they'll do what God wants them to do if they're going to follow the Lord. But if my children, listen, this is a strong statement. If my children do not have a sound doctrine when they leave my home, if I haven't passed that down, then I have failed as a pastor, I mean, as a parent, to teach, to pass that down. It is my duty. Now, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Does that mean they'll never sin? <laughs> no. Does that mean they'll never uh, go astray at some point in their lives? No. But if I've done my job as a teacher, I have put in them sound doctrine that they carry with them. 
uh, my, my children are here at the, the Christian school, and I, I believe, I went to a Christian school, I believe wholeheartedly in a Christian school. But I've seen kids that went to a Christian school that didn't turn out for the Lord. I've kids, seen kids that went to the public school that did turn out for the Lord. I've seen, uh, a, and both, I've seen both in both cases and both in, in even homeschooling. What's the difference in all those? In almost every case I've watched, it's the parents putting in, seeing the importance of teaching the Word of God at home. Taking the word of God, taking sound doctrine and passing it on. Because listen, there's going to be false teachers out there. They're on the TV and on the radio and on the internet. They're everywhere and they're going to teach false doctrine. And they better know what's true. Because they're going to end up shipwrecked if we don't teach them sound doctrine. If I as a pastor don't teach sound doctrine and teach it and pass it down to, to the people of, of this church, then I'm a failure because there's people on every street corner preaching false doctrine. And as a Sunday school teacher, if, there's, if you're a Sunday school teacher or you uh, uh, teach in any capacity here at Lafayette Bible Baptist Church, you better be on your knees daily praying for your students and, and in the Word of God studying so that you can pass down to them sound doctrine that they stay in the faith. You ought to get at the end of your teaching time when your time to be offered up, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look back and say, hey, there's someone that I passed sound doctrine to. There's someone that I, I taught and they've got it and they're continuing to go with the truth in the faith. There ought to be people behind you that you've passed it on to because there are false teachers everywhere. Paul turned, uh, uh, delivered these guys up to Satan, not because they just didn't like, he didn't like them or they didn't, no, they were causing others to go shipwrecked, to believe false doctrine. God help our church be a lighthouse and not a navigator leading people to shipwreck. Help us. Remember what I said what teaching was? It's open, uh, 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 was shining a light. Help us be the, the lighthouse that, that stands on a hillside that, that points out on the sea and shows the problems and helps people navigate around the rocks rather than a navigator. Listen, there's, there's several teenagers here from Faith here. If you have someone who's trying to navigate you away from the lighthouse, navigate you away from your parents, navigate you away from your, your, your principal or your pastor, stay away from them. You're going to end up shipwrecked. The lighthouse will show you the problems. The truth, the doctrine. Uh, the truth, the doctrine will light up those problems and you'll see. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul and encouraging Timothy to, to stay with the word of God and stay true to sound doctrine. I pray you'd help us as a church to do the same. Help us never veer or stray to false teaching and false doctrine, other doctrine. Help us to preach your word, Lord, I pray, with power we pray and ask in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray it. And amen.